Hey everyone, welcome to Dave's Bones Eye. On today's episode, spring has officially arrived. We got a lot of work ahead of us. Spring officially arrived at about 4 o'clock Minnesota time this morning on Saturday the 20th of March. March Madness basketball? Yeah, you know, I'll catch a few games here and there if I have extra time, which I won't have a ton because, yeah, springtime and repotting season is here. So on today's episode, I'm really going to kind of focus on what I have to do to get myself uh, a successful spring repotting season. Now, I've done a whole bunch of repots already, particularly on my Katoni Asters. So on a few of my episodes, I was able to get my Gatoni Asters into uh, small pots, get them ready to go. There's one. Here's one of the other ones, a little bit deeper pot. That one's got all kinds of branch structure ready to start taking off. I did also repot um, a couple of my barberries in the last weekend here. So I got some barberries that are still in the cold frame because, again, we've had temps that are going to be below the freezing mark on, on several evenings. I don't want these fine roots to be damaged. I've got my Japanese quince back here that's starting to bud out. Uh, they've got quarter to half inch growth on some of the uh, uh, new buds now, so that's wanting to grow, uh, which is good. Uh, we'll keep that in there for a little bit longer. I got my repot of my, of my uh, juniper back there, the one I repotted just this spring. And this one is uh, feeling a little bit dry, so long as I'm in here. I'm going to go ahead and give this just a little bit of water. I don't have my spray bottle uh, bottles with the holes in the top. So I'm just going to go ahead and gently give this a nice watering right here. Nice through and through. There we go. Um, everything else in here is uh, holding pretty true because I've got that sphagnum moss on there. They've been recently really watered because of the repotting. But now there's my little juniper. Well, I stole its spot. We'll put that back in here for a couple of more days for sure. We do have a nice warm spell, 50s uh, the next couple of days, close to 60, uh, but then upper 40s and low 50s, so these have to stay in here for a little while longer. A lot of chitter chatter on Minnesota Bonsai Society right now about do I take my trees out, do I take my trees, keep them in, playing that Bonsai Shuffle dance, yeah. Um, we have to probably wait more than anything else if you don't want a lot of work. One person suggested that if your cold frame is super far away from where you're going to keep it outside, like I could keep it right outside my garage here with nice sun all day and then bring it back in here. The problem with that, of course, is, is these have not seen any sun yet. So we don't want to do that. I want to put these in the shade, slowly introduce them to sun and the more daylight. So I'll leave this open right here for a little indirect sun as I work today because it's now pushing uh, mid 40s here on this uh, Saturday morning. Uh, my other quints back here. I'm going to show this one to you too because it's super exciting. Uh, when you come and you uh, look at your uh, cold frame, and the Japanese quince are very early to bud out. And they're also very bud early to flower. So right here, we've got a flower. Right here, we've got a flower that's just ready to show all its glory. And it's only March the 20th, and it's in a cold frame still. So um, we're going to let this thing stay in the cold frame for a little bit longer. I'll pull it out here maybe in a week or two, hopefully get some uh, late blooming buds. Uh, but for right now, it's going to stay in the cold frame so I know that it is protected. Um, also to show you in the cold frame that life goes on even when it's dark inside here. So these, uh, don't know if these uh, are going to survive, but there's a bud down here that wants to shoot. And look right here. This is two inches of growth. Now this is a really t small twig from a weeping willow cutting from last year. I just threw them in here. If they survive, great. If they don't, I don't. I have so many, I'm not so worried. But look at this growth right here, in the dark. It knows it's spring, it knows it's time to wake up. Um, we just have to make sure that we uh, don't take it out too soon because it's gonna kinda hurt that early growth. This needs some water back here, so I'm gonna go ahead and give that some water. And this uh, batch of cuttings also needs some water, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I don't have my sprayer. But we'll get some water running down here a little bit. Everything else looks to be pretty good. So today's agenda. This, this setup has all been repotted except for the two Japanese maples in here. So the Japanese maples, I'm not sure if I'm going to repot them this year or not. So this is uh, the bottom part of my air layer that I did a couple years ago. I uh, made a major chop here that's almost completely healed over now. 
Um, it's got some weird brand structure, but I got a one that's going uh, up here, one that's coming down here. This might be a little low. And then I've got these two funky ones here. Uh, but these grow so fast and so profusely that who knows what uh, new branches, buds are gonna come crazy on this one this year. The buds are just starting to get light green and they want to go as well. I might be uh, repotting some of the Japanese maples. So I have two or three that I'm considering. So that's two. So of my inventory so far, I've got two trees in here that I might consider repotting here before April hits or before mid-April for sure because if these are starting to grow now, they're gonna start growing more and more. The internodes might be too long and weak leggy growth. We wanna get them outside as soon as possible now for the extra light. But like today I said earlier, I'm gonna leave this open here so it's say, hey, look, there's some light. So it's not pitch black. Um, and we are temps in the 40s, so this is just gonna stay right where it's at because the thermometer says 41 degrees right now. So let's go check out the garden and let's check out the cabin cold frame. We're gonna take an inventory of my March Madness, my spring, and how I'm gonna be repotting this spring. So let's check those out. Next up, we have the garden. So this is where all the stuff from the winter being protected by the wind barrier has now mostly softened up. The ice below has lifted up. So if I move one of my uh, harvested larch, it's no longer frozen to the ground. Go to the next one, and that one pops up too, just today. Still a little bit of ice at the bottom of those, which means there's still some, some uh, probably some ice and frozen water at the very bottom of these trees from the winter long season. And this one came up as well. The one I'm really curious about is the Mugo Pine. And there it comes for the first time. So I picked up this Mugo Pine at the nursery last year for 20 bucks. So the Mugo Pine, you'll notice at the end of last year, started to get these really tall shoots. So um, it's ready, it's wanting to grow, it's vigorous. This one is gonna be one of my high priority repots this spring. I cannot wait to dig into that one. I don't think I'll do that one today, but we'll, we'll see. My excitement level is just already getting exponentially bigger. We have all of these harvested larches, but we're not gonna touch them this year. This is gonna be year two, uh, kind of year one and a half really because we pulled them out of the swamps up north, the marshes, the bogs, and they're sitting in a lot of pumice and sphagnum moss. We gotta let them get more roots this year because their roots are very, very fine and very, very few because uh, they're in this bog system, right? So a lot of times the roots grow kind of higher on the tree and they just kind of reach towards that sphagnum moss. And then the, the, the season, when the water goes down late in the season, some of those roots die back. And then you have some more lower roots, but they're not established. And there's this cycle where they seem to they just grow in sparse areas. And so you have to be really careful with the harvest, I've been told. This is my first, second year. <laughs> and so um, after harvesting these, we're gonna let them grow all year again, just in their uh, nursery pots. We're gonna keep them watered really well in the sphagnum moss, because that's still what they're used to. And the larches love the water. My larch forest. We have to repot my forest. It's the five larches here that I trimmed late last fall, early winter. And uh, we're gonna get this into that uh, new pot that I made with the boot tray. We're gonna get that in there. So there's a repot. This guy back here is a Siberian pine um, or Siberian fir. And uh, this is a tree that I got from uh, my good friend at the Kruger Tree Farm in uh, Lake Elmo, Minnesota. And, and uh, this was a tree that was nicked by the lawnmower in between the rows of Christmas trees. And it's a Christmas tree uh, farm. And he thought that this would be really cool as a bonsai. He said, hey, Dave, uh, you wanna check this one out? And, and so I dug it up and he let me have this one. And uh, so I got some wire on that. We might get that in a pot this year, but I also may hold back for one more year because I dug it out of the ground last year. And uh, I wanna see those roots grow. I got a lot of tall, tall trees back here, little sticks or big sticks in pots. Those are all gonna be um, hopefully in a uh, forest planting pretty soon. And so those guys are um, actually the poplar trees and I want a poplar forest. I have some poplar trees in my Minnesota forest, but I have more of them to make a poplar forest. I hope to get that going this year too. There's a transplant as well. And speaking of uh, that, I got this system right here. This is two trees and there's a root structure. I don't think you're gonna see it from way back over there, but there's a root right here that came from the mother plant or whatever it is, and there's two trees growing boom right up from that root. So it's almost again like a raft where the tree fell over and all these suckers are coming up to grow to trees. Um, so this is again gonna be part of my forest. 
I might throw a maple or two in the forest because I have some random maples that are sticks and twiggy. This one has some nice, just curvy, swervy motions. This has got to go in a pot sometime, but not this year because we can keep it in the pot and let it grow super big for, for later on. So that's about all in here, but there's some stuff up here. I got the big lilac, that's gonna be untouched. I got my Amir maple, that's gonna be untouched. I do have another pine that I picked up that's still in a nursery. Got a nice thick trunk in there. Um, I did do a little trimming on that tree. Um, we might get that in a pot this year, but it's uh, it's not one of those trees that you look at and says like, oh, it's growing like crazy. So I think I'm gonna have to leave that in that uh, pot to let it grow some more. And then the rest of these um, are some various junipers that I don't need to touch this year. Let's head over to another section of my garden. I'm back by the compost area right now and I've got a couple of trees that I picked up at a really great uh, uh, late summer, early fall nursery find. I've got a whole bunch of viburnums um, and I've already repotted one. We talked about one over there. Uh, this is a viburnum. Uh, this is a variety of a viburnum back there and this one right here with this really nice white trunk here. It has a very white kind of pasty trunk. And uh, we got a little bit of a chew back here, I think, from a rabbit, but that'll be some character in the tree if I keep this side. We're gonna get this into a pot this spring, maybe today. I might tackle this one today. We have a Taylor Eastern Red Cedar right here. So uh, this is a Juniperus uh, Virginiana, and uh, I got two of these, and one I kind of trimmed back a little bit last year and did a little work on. This one I didn't touch. So uh, uh, this one uh, we'll try to get into a pot this year as well before uh, spring leaves us. And so then, we've got a couple in here too. One, two, three, four, five more trees. This right here is uh, another one of the barberries, super tall barberry. Um, might cut all of this back and maybe if I could, could I create this into a literati style barberry? Uh, who knows? We'll see about that. The Siberian elm forest. I've got one big forest here. I wanna make it into two or three forests. So we got that project coming up. So it's a bit breezy here on this spring day. Typically very breezy in Minnesota when it's spring. When the temps get warm, we're super excited. And then the winds come in and kind of crush our spirits just a little bit. But I'm in the cabin cold frame so I can get some close up of some of the trees. Uh, one of them is actually kind of a follow up for you with my repot season. And then I'll tell you in here what are the things I'm gonna be working on uh, in my spring March madness. So let's take a look at some of these trees. First up, let's do the update. So I have told you that I've done a few repots on my Catoni Asters. Now these are, these are called Autumn, Autumn Infernos. Yes, the Catoni Aster Bonfire, another nickname for them. This Autumn Inferno has some really great fall colors. Now I repotted this one first, I think a weekend ago. And look at the leaves on the uh, tree. Look at the growth. So I repotted this thing and chopped it up really pretty good. If you go back to my recent previous uh, Catoni Aster uh, episode, uh, I'll put that episode on here, I'll link it for you in the description. And here, look at the leaves. So it's love and life in the cold frame. It's not too cold for those fine roots and all of these leaves are starting to uh, come on out. Look at that, they're getting bigger, looking good. Let's bring it over to the other one that's in the sunshine right now. I gotta darken my aperture here so you guys can actually see that. Wow, look at how bright that is. So the glorious sunshine coming into the uh, cabin is highlighting those leaves right there. And you see those leaves? Yeah. Let's pull that one out and take a nice look at that. So here's the other Catoni Aster out of that bright, bright sun back onto the uh, one of the benches here. And look at all those leaves as well. Opening up, starting to grow. After the stress of a repot and in the cold frame, it's doing fine. Temperature's hovering right around the low 40s. It's getting sunshine in the cabin cold frame here. And so there's a little quick update for you midstream here of this episode. A couple Katoni Asters love and life. We've got one of my Japanese maples right there too. That one uh, might be time for a repot. It's in a super small square pot. I have to look at my data to see when I repotted that one last. And this is uh, one of my wider based trunk maples. There's the uh, Nabari section there at the bottom as it hovers the ground and then we come back up here. And it's kind of a weirdly shaped tree. It looks really great with all its leaves on in the summertime. But right now this winter silhouette uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. So here we go. But not a bad canopy once you get it up there and all the leaves are on there. You don't see some of the imperfections. But this was chopped back there. Um, you can see that chop. 
pretty big and it's over halfway healed already in just a couple years. So there's a little bit of movement on this trunk, just a little bit of movement here. And that first major branch right there is doing okay. We need some more budding on that one and uh, we'll see what happens. But I think that one could be repotted as well. Our Japanese maples every two to three years and I think it's been two years on that one. I have a couple of uh, junipers that I'll be working on this year with Peter T. Super excited to be working with Peter T. Uh, Peter has been uh, a part of the Minnesota Bonsai Society's fundamental program. Super excited to see him again this spring uh, and then summer or fall. Super excited to be working with Peter this uh, season on our junipers. I also have my first trident maple. And the trident maple also gonna be doing work with Peter T. And look at that, we had some big chops last year. We didn't do much work on the uh, trident maple. We just chopped them. We're gonna keep them alive. I don't know that we're repotting them this year or letting them grow. Um, that'll be for Peter to work with us here in the coming weeks. So super excited to be working with Peter T again on the trident maple and the junipers. So awfully excited about that. So I got a couple other cuttings back there. We got Texas cuttings, we've got juniper cuttings. Um, and so we have some other tra uh, repots to do for sure. All of these in the bottom here, junipers. Um, there's a repot right there, one of the um, barberries that I recently did. Barberry back there. We'll see how those recover here in the uh, cabin cold frame after their repots. Then of course we have the big monster, the big monster Acer palmatum, the uh, uh, Japanese maple, um, sitting here in this great big box. We're going to try to air layer this guy up here. So we're going to maybe try an air layer right in here or air layer up in here. We'll see. Um, air layer this year and then the big repot next year. So can't wait for that one, but it's going to be uh, another year out before I repot it. Um, all right, we're super close on everything. Let's pull back and let's work on a tree today. I think that's the list. I think I came up with at least 10, 15. I think when I looked at them the other day, I might have come up with about 20 different trees we have to work on. My biggest concern tree this year, right here, this guy, the Satsuki Azalea. I was going to not let the flowers bloom this year. Um, they say you should let the flowers bloom about once every three years if you want the flowers. Otherwise, it takes a lot of energy from the tree. But when I had my cold frame go kaput on me this year for about a 24-hour period, I worry the most about the Satsuki. It looks the most like it's in trouble. So this one's just going to be in the recovery mode. I'm not going to repot it. Although I've been tended to think about, who do I repot it to see what the roots are doing after that cold snap? Do I have some dye back in the roots? What's going to happen? So we'll see if this starts uh, healing up and starting to uh, wake up and we'll make our decisions from there. So another potential repot. But there we have it, the cabin cold frame. Time to get to work. The sun is shining today, which is providing the optical illusion that it's a wonderfully warm spring day. So about two weeks ago when I was doing some repotting, it was 48 degrees, not a breath of air. I was down by the fire pit, loving life, repotting trees. The wind's blowing at about 15 to 20 miles an hour. The sun's out, it's about 45 degrees, but it's not uh, conducive to sit there and get cold while I uh, work on my trees. However, the sacrifice is, is I'm over here behind my garage, which is blocking the wind coming from the south, which is bringing the warm temperatures, but it's shaded back here but it'll make for a little bit better repotting session. And when I want to chat with you all on the camera, we won't get as much, hopefully, wind gushing through that microphone. So we've got the viburnum here, and I was super excited to find these trees at the nursery last year for great discounted prices. Look at this, is this a 20, 30 gallon pot? And so the viburnums, I've been starting to do some research on them, and I found these great looking trees, bought them, because I've learned if you don't buy them and come back, they're gonna be gone, right? So I bought these viburnums. I got three different varieties. And so the thing about the viburnum is, is there's in the genus, there's over 150 evergreen, semi-evergreen, and deciduous versions of viburnum. So this is a deciduous variety. The trees all lost, or lost, they lost all their leaves. So I've got the deciduous uh, variety here. And I loved this white looking bark. So it has, uh, when I saw it, it reminded me of um, the, um, well, I like birches. You know, I've got the birch forest I want to work on. I want that white color, right? Um, also the poplars that have that white trunk. And then when the leaves pop in the spring, you get the light color green with the white and then the pine trees behind it. So the poplars kind of pop out and in the fall, uh, they pop out when all the leaves are gone still because the trunks are kind of whitish. So I love this white looking trunk, very white, pasty looking trunk here. Naturally, 
right? So no lime sulfur needed if I wanted to do that. And what I'm super excited about this early in the spring, this was kept outside next to the fence for a little wind block. I've got a couple of itty bitty buds going right there and there, way down here. And I learned last year in my keeping it in my yard that it does back bud. So we've got a woody trunk that back buds on old wood. Fantastic, I can make this into a bonsai tree. So I'm gonna dive in and start working on the viburnum here. And we got a lot of soil to get rid of. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and see if we can loosen this guy up. And this is one of those, I wish I had my buddy Michael over here to lift up like when we worked on the beastie. Because this thing is big. And so I don't know if I'll keep this as a twin trunk or chop this one completely off. Um, but again, this main trunk, you can see I chopped this last year. I have a couple of scars already from just chopping it and getting branch, getting rid of branches I knew I wouldn't need. I think those are gonna do just fine healing over time. We'll see this year how they heal. Um, a learning process, totally an experiment for me. So let's dig in, let's get some dirt out and we'll get this thing uh, repotted. Now that could be good or bad. It came out super easily, which meant there's not a lot of roots down below, which means they probably up potted this thing and uh, maybe it just didn't have fantastic growth in the last couple of uh, growing seasons. So that's a little concerning when you rip it out and it comes out that easily. But let's get it into my little tray here for a little assembly. Now let's forget the tray. We're just gonna have to sweep So I'm going to get the soil all loosened up from here very gently because I'm not as familiar with these roots. So while I do that, um, we'll talk about the viburnums and a little bit of the varieties, show you some pictures that I've been finding on the wonderful uh, internet. And uh, I'll do this while we uh, talk about the viburnum and look at some photographs. With a little pronunciation guide, I learned that it's viburnum. So, a genus of more than 150 evergreen, semi-evergreen, and deciduous woody plants, many native to uh, North America. Um, but their range extends Southeast Asia, South America, and they're admired for the foliage, flowers, and their fruit. Most grow in any moderately fertile, moist, but well-drained soil in full sun to part shade. Some uh, viburnums prefer dry soil, and some of my research talked about how these can be placed almost anywhere in your yard, and you probably will be happy. The three varieties that I picked up from the nursery find uh, were the arrowwood viburnum, which is the blue muffin, which I worked on first. So the arrowwood, like sun or part shade, is zoned three to eight, so it can handle down to 40 below Fahrenheit. Late spring white flowers, fall fruit blue when planted with another, you'll get those uh, fall fruit, and then very deer tolerant if that's important to you, and of course well-drained soil as we've talked about. The next variety that I picked up was the Viburnum lantana, or the Mohican Viburnum. Sun or part shade, zone three to seven, so they really can handle Minnesota cold hardy uh, uh, situations. Creamy white flowers in spring, orange red fruit in the summer, and they have a purple bronze fall foliage, which is probably why I picked it up. That purple bronze fall foliage, I can't wait for that. I also picked up the Nannyberry Viburnum, also known as the Viburnum lentago. Sun to part shade again, zone two to eight. So this one can really handle our cold winters, which we don't even have that much anymore in Minnesota. In that zone two, not even close. White spring flowers and some blue or black fruit in the fall with a reddish purpley leaf again. Tolerates wet, heavy soils. So this one is even more tolerant uh, with really wet soils. But of course, once we get them in a bonsai pot, we've got well-drained soil, we are good to go. They are the viburnums. Oh, and I can't wait to see the results. I haven't cut off any roots yet in my raking out of the soil. I found my rake, incidentally. 
In raking out the uh, soil, I did break a few uh, roots. Some snapped right off because they were dead. Some of them are still uh, there laying ready for me to cut off. But a couple of things to think about now for me as I ch tackle this brand new variety. So I don't know much about this variety, so I'm not gonna bare root it. I'm gonna leave some of the soil on here now, and so in two years from now or so, when I go to repot this again, I'll take a little bit more of that black dirt out of here. But I'm really glad that I'm repotting this because we wanna get it into some really good bonsai soil. And for me, there's this dilemma out there, or there could be a dilemma, or people might go and do something opposite of me because they wanna go in a pot to let it grow real big. Well, this has a, a, a two inch trunk maybe, maybe a little bit less than two. It's thicker, um, it's a size that I'm okay with. I don't want it to be in a nursery pot for five more years to get really super thick. Um, I'm ready to start putting this into a bonsai pot right away for a couple of reasons. And one is to have the better soil. Um, I just took this out of the pot and almost half of it came out without much effort because there wasn't much below but dirt. But I have a lot of nice feeder roots on here. I'll be cutting some of these back there's some feeder roots up on top, so we're okay. I think we're gonna be okay. But one of the things I've discovered about my green thumb, or lack thereof, as I've become a better gardener over the years, a better bonsai enthusiast, and I, I can't really say a better house plant because I don't have a lot of house plants because I have cats and they eat them all. That's why I have a plant room where they're not allowed to go in because they'll eat my bonsai. But I don't seem to pay as close attention to those trees that are in pots. I don't water the um, nursery pots with dirt in them. So when I have a tree that goes into a bonsai pot, I instantly have so much more, I don't know if it's respect or, or worry or care. My mindset goes right to, okay, I gotta watch this thing every single day. And I watch it every day and I see if it needs water. And if it does, I water it. If it doesn't, I hold off. And I know when I put my trees in a bonsai pot, I just take that much better care of them. And I've killed, I've killed house plants and I've killed trees that are left in nursery pots with soil because I think I overwater them and then they get all mucky and root rot and it doesn't work out. Oh, I heard a branch break. I don't want that to happen. So I'm not going to bare root this, but we are going to make a few trims on here. We're going to get rid of some of the roots that are dangling. We have to decide if we're, what kind of pot we're going to have for this guy. Um, but I don't need some of these long roots. Now, my concern right now, going into this repot, is I don't have a pot that's big enough. I do have some makeshift pots that are homemade, that a lot of the club members have used as temporary pots. So I'm gonna put those uh, to possible use here this spring with this tree in particular. So here's a couple of these big roots that have nothing growing on them. So we're gonna go ahead and cut those out. Anything growing straight down from the bottom here, we're cutting out. So here's a here's a root right here. These roots right here, look at that. I almost could, I just ripped it right off. That under here, not doing anything. I got a little nub here of what might have been the tap root. So we're gonna go ahead and try to chop that off of here. This is one of those trees that has a couple of uh, concave areas in here in the root structure. So I have to make sure that bonsai soil is really nicely mounded in the pot. So it goes and fills all this area as this root lays down because I got this bumped here at the bottom. And until I see how this thing's gonna grow, I don't wanna get rid of too many of these big roots. But this guy right here, this guy right here, I can probably break it right off, yeah. No feeder roots on that guy. This is a very weird, I've never seen a, a tap root, or if this e even is the tap root, quite like this. It's like about six or seven or eight little or medium sized roots here instead of one big like tap root. So this is this uh, rooted out really interestingly. Okay, so we're coming to a point here now where I have the basic structure. We'll notice a little weakness in here, some dieback, little dried roots up here. A little stronger and thicker back on this side. And again, I'm gonna probably get a little more soil out of there, but not completely 100% dry, bare-rooted. But now we have to think of pots for this guy. 
So this is my biggest bonsai pot that's a trainer pot. And if I cut some roots back, I could get it in this pot. There wouldn't be as much room for growth, but with a little bit of trimming, that guy fits in there. Now the challenge with this is, what's gonna be a front someday? How is this gonna fit here? And maybe this tree is better this way, which will not fit in this pot. I would need a bigger pot. So that's why I brought out my round. These are like uh, uh, pans that you buy, three gallon pan here for animals on the farm. So here's a round pot that fits this tree much better. And then I can turn the trunk around and maybe have that the front instead of the way it had to be this way in the other tree. My other option is I've been making some crates. A lot of people have been talking about the boxes and growing your trees in boxes. So I've made some wooden boxes and this fits in here quite nicely. And I can spin this around to make any side my front that I want. So that's a new box that I've created that has all the holes drilled in already. I got some two by fours for the base and there's all the holes you can see. I can put in some, some screen in there, get some soil in there, tie this thing down and we have a nice square box for this viburnum. This does not have any holes in it yet. I'm just going to wait with that and I'm going to try one of my new boxes for the viburnum. So these are five, these are six inch fence pieces that I've uh, attached to the 2x4, about halfway down the 2x4, so the depth is only about 4 inches, maybe not even quite 4. And so once I get this in here, it's going to be nice, the soil line will be good in the right, right, uh, right height. And there are some concerns with boxes that of course you have too much space and it's a lot of soil and wasted space. You can also put corner pieces here and you can make this a little bit smaller with a little bit less soil. I think this, I think this tree is going to fit in here just fine. So I'm going to go ahead and utilize this box for this tree. So I need to go get some supplies and we will get this thing in the pot. I have my sheetrock tape here that I'm putting over the pre-drilled holes. I had about uh, 25, 30 holes or so. And I'm going to put the sheetrock tape on here as well. So I get as little loss of the uh, bonsai soil as possible. So this roll has lasted me three or four years. We're going to put this tree into the pot. If you're picky about the pot that you made, I don't have my seams here. This is just a training pot, a training uh, box if you will. So it's not really crucial there. My biggest thing is how I'm going to put this tree into the pot. This again has the uh, double tree here that has the damage. We'll know, who knows if that survives this year or not. We'll keep it on for now. We can always cut it back later. So in regards to a front, I'm a little nervous about uh, you know this being in the front. I would want to twist it more this way to see this branch and who knows what's going to happen here. We got some nice movement back here and this branch is a nice branch. So we're just going to put it something like about there. So I need wires to kind of go over this way to secure this tree because of the lack of roots on this side and the lack of roots on this side. We're going to go ahead and put it so it goes over the structure there.
I hooked up the hose the other day for the first time because we still will have freezing temperatures at night. So you want to make sure your hoses are in the garage at night or drained of all its water or enough of its water where it's not going to be a problem. But I haven't re-put it back on yet. So I'm going to have to have at least uh, one of these water bottles, probably two before I'm done after the sphagna moss. I see water coming out already. Here we have the first stages of that. We'll get some sphagnum moss on here. We've got enough uh, aerial roots, not aerial roots, uh, surface roots rather. Our surface roots will dry up. And uh, again, with, with this being an uncertain new variety for me, not sure how this surface roots, how they're gonna dry out this time of year. I wanna make sure that it has every chance to have success. So we're gonna put some sphagnum moss on there. I think there's, there we go. Gotta be careful at first when you water the sphagnum moss so it doesn't go all over the place. All right. Now we have a nice little layer on there. Filtration for the water, as I always say, keeping it moist up on top, hopefully promoting the, 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 the potential of uh, some moss growth on here. Now I can't put this outside yet because I just exposed all of these fine roots from the protection of that soil and that insulation of a 30 gallon pot. If I put this thing now with bones aerox and it freezes tonight, um, I would freeze all of those little roots. Uh, this was not in a cold frame, so it's already been dormant. It's already done all that, it's hibernated, it's ready to go. But we're gonna put this thing in the garage at night unless it stays above freezing. And for the next four or five days, it might stay about freezing, I'll be good, but I can put it right back in the garage here, right behind us in, in no time at all. So we have a repot of the viburnum. Now, there are a couple of things I can consider doing here before we uh, call it a day, and that would be some chops here, um, only because um, I might wanna make a couple aesthetic changes, not a ton. This right here is a bud. Right there's a bud below this branch. This is a bud right here. Now this is a thick branch, a thinner branch, and even thinner ramification here, great. Uh, but this is gonna create a bulge. I don't want that bud. That would be too bulgy right there. Um, I did see some other buds up here though. If you look right here, there's a bud right there growing. There's a bud right there starting. Um, as I've turned this tree around a couple of times, as I've looked, there's a bud trying to grow right there. But I mentioned earlier, right here, that bud, that could be a, a decent branch there, although with this big chop here and this potential bulge might be too high still. But we want this tree to survive. I'm not gonna cut those buds off. Um, we've got some new growth on here. So we have a new bud right there. We have a couple of buds right here. And then I don't know if you can see the top. So as we look at the top of the tree for you here, new bud, New bud, two grown off to the side here. New bud, two here, two here. New bud on the tip, two back here. We've got two nice ones back here, two back here, two way back here, couple back here. So this thing is, is ready to go. Um, these are buds are all viable and all new this spring and they're ready to uh, make into a tree. Will I cut anything off this year? So here's my, here's my question. I got some turn this way. And then it goes up this way, a little bit this way. You can see these old sections of growth might get new buds near there. And then I've got this section here with this branch growing up this way. Do I cut this guy off here to make it shorter? Now I'd be cutting off a double branch here with all these buds. This would be a little bit of an eyesore in front of us. If I cut this off right here, these two will grow. So I cut that off here for these two. This is a major branch that grew last year because it's newer wood. This is the older white wood, but it grows kind of in a weird way off of this branch. You see how it curves around here? So I either take that off or take the older one off and let that movement continue. 
don't think I can cut that branch with my size and cutters right now, so I might have to leave it for one more season here. But I will cut off this top one just to shorten it a little bit. We've got all these new buds growing here, even on this branch right here and here. This is an old stub. We'll see what grows here. We've got like three branches growing from it. There's a bud growing straight down. I'll take that off. This inside one I'll take off. Just cleaning up some old stumps. Not a whole lot I want to do to this guy. There are some buds in this V right here that you can't see. So this thing is going to bud back a lot, I'm, I'm suspecting. They're growing everywhere, so this will be really fun to see. This one's going at a super weird angle. I'm just going to cut that off. I'm just going to cut, I'm going to leave this go right now. I don't want to do any more to this tree. I want the growth that is existing to feed the roots. I want the roots to feed what's trying to grow. And we'll just leave that and call it a day. So there we have a viburnum. And uh, super, super fun and exciting to get this one in a pot. I can't wait to see this one uh, leaf out. Now, with all the varieties that I've gotten, um, I'm going to have to double check which ones might flower this spring, which ones might have fruit in the fall, and which ones change colors in the fall, because i got three different varieties. It's going to be a really fun year with experimentation. That'll do it for this episode, though. Thanks for watching. Click like, subscribe if you haven't, and uh, I'm glad you tagged along today. All right, we got a lot of work to do, so let's go uh, find some more trees to work on, okay? All right, take care of yourselves, everybody, and make sure you take care of your bonsai, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.